Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing the clinical prediction rules, or CPRs, for three types of manipulations. Those are going to be lumbopelvic manipulations, cervical manipulations, and then thoracic manipulations for mechanical neck pain. And for any one of these clinical prediction rules, you have a certain number of criteria. So for example, in the lumbopelvic manipulation CPR, there's five criteria. In the cervical manipulation one, there's four, and in the last one, there's six. And the more of these that are satisfied for a given patient, the more likely that that particular manipulation will be successful. On the other hand, if let's say only two of these were satisfied for the patient, but the other three were not, well then only two of the five are satisfied for that patient, and that's only 40% of them. And so that makes it very unlikely that this technique would be effective for that particular patient. And the same thing's true of the other two clinical prediction rules. Let's first take a look at the lumbopelvic manipulation clinical prediction rule. So the first thing on here is the duration of the symptoms less than 16 days. So if a patient comes in and they have lumbopelvic pain, but they've only been experiencing it for 10 days, that's a check right there. That's good. That satisfies one of those things. If they've had it chronically, well, then you don't get to put a check mark there because that's not less than 16 days. So more or less, we're asking if the pain or whatever their symptoms are, is it acute? Also, they can have no signs or symptoms distal to the knee. They can have signs and symptoms in the thighs and the hips, but it cannot be distal to the knee. Also, we're going to look at the fear avoidance beliefs questionnaire, specifically the work-related part, and we want to assess the score on that. And if it's less than 19, then that's satisfied there. So right here is the FABQ, and remember it has two sections. The top part is the physical activity section. This bottom part, which is a little bit longer, is the work-related section. Um, you'd probably give them the entire FABQ, not just the work part. But again, um, you're only looking at that work-related score, and if it's less than 19, then that's satisfied. Also, uh, if they have at least one hypomobile lumbar segment, and that you would assess with spring testing. You're assessing for hypomobility. You certainly wouldn't use lumbopelvic manipulations if they have hypermobility because lumbopelvic manipulations are not only designed to reduce pain, but also to increase range of motion. Hypermobility, they have too much range of motion. So, of course, this is going to be indicated when they have at least one hypomobile lumbar segment. The last of these criteria has to do with the hips. So if at least one or both of the hips has 35 degrees internal rotation range of motion, then that favors a positive outcome for lumbopelvic manipulation. Notice it can be both hips, but it has to be at least one, left or right. And you can obviously eyeball this, and if it's obviously more than 35 degrees, well then you check that. But if you want to be really precise or accurate, you can use the goniometer to measure to make sure that it's at least 35 degrees of internal rotation. Now for this clinical prediction rule, the more of these that are satisfied for the patient, the more likely that the lumbopelvic manipulation is going to have a favorable outcome. Um, typically, you're going to want at least four of these five to be satisfied in order for this to be favorable. So four or all five of these. Okay? And assuming you have at least four out of five or maybe all five of these that are satisfied for the patient, well, then you can proceed to actually doing the manipulation. And generally, it's going to be either the lumbar sideline thrust manipulation over here, or the supine lumbopelvic thrust shown over here. Hopefully we'll eventually have videos where these are demonstrated. Now let's move on and talk about the cervical manipulation clinical prediction rules, and there's four criteria here. The first is also a duration of signs and symptoms, but in this case we're allowing more time for mechanical neck pain than we did for lumbopelvic pain, and we're allowing no more than 38 days. So if a patient comes in and they've had neck pain for about a month, well, then that's satisfied. 30 or 31 days, certainly less than 38. So again, we're just checking to see if it's relatively acute. Also, if there's a difference, a side-to-side -side difference in cervical rotation of at least 10 degrees, that also rules up that cervical manipulation will be favorable for that person. So for example, if somebody comes in with the ability to rotate, let's say to the left, 60 degrees, but then they can only rotate 45 degrees to the right, that's a 15 degree difference between their left and right rotations. 
Um, and because 15 degrees is more than 10 degrees, well, that's certainly a significant side-to-side -side difference. So that would be determined using a goniometer on the neck. Also, if the patient experiences pain when you're doing spring testing on them, particularly in the posterior to anterior direction, at at least one segment in the middle cervical spine, that rules up using a cervical manipulation. So for example, if you were doing this uh, PA right here on the C4 spinous process and they experience pain, all it takes is one of those and that would be satisfied. This last criterion is interesting. Simply the expectation that a manipulation will help the patient's pain and their symptoms. So if you're going to give a patient a cervical manipulation, but they're kind of skeptical and kind of doubtful that it'll, it'll help them, it actually is less likely to help them. Whereas if they're expecting that the manipulation will help them and reduce their pain, it actually makes it more likely that it will reduce their pain and possibly increase range of motion in their neck. So expectation that manipulation will help, check. Now, with the cervical manipulation clinical prediction rule, we want at least three out of four of these to be positive, or in other words, satisfied for the patient, because if three out of four are positive, that's associated with a positive likelihood ratio of 13.5. Uh, generally, when you have a positive likelihood ratio of at least 10, that's pretty darn good. 13.5 is even better. Uh, and what that basically translates to is if three out of four of these are positive and you do a cervical manipulation, on the patient, they're gonna have a 90% success rate. So it's gonna be 90% successful in terms of pain reduction, symptom modulation, range of motion, etc. Well, then you can proceed to actually doing the cervical manipulation, and the main one that's done is the supine cervical rotational thrust that you actually see right here. Again, hopefully we'll have video demonstrations on this in the future. The last clinical prediction rule is the thoracic manipulation for mechanical neck pain. So believe it or not, if somebody has neck pain, you can actually manipulate the thoracic spine and get symptom resolution in the neck. And this is the clinical prediction rule for that. There's actually six of these criteria. Let's actually look at those right now. Again, we're gonna start off with a timeline, the duration. So in this case, we want the duration of the signs and symptoms to have persisted no more than 30 days. Okay? So if they come in and it's 20 days, that's a check. Again, for neck pain, not thoracic pain, neck pain. We also want no signs and symptoms distal to the shoulder, okay? So they can have pain in the neck, they can have pain maybe in the thoracic spine, but no pain distal to the shoulder. This is another one like the lumbopelvic manipulation where we're gonna administer the FABQ. But in this case, notice we're not looking at the work-related part, now we're looking at the physical activity part of the FABQ, and in this case, uh, we're looking for a score less than 12. If the score is less than 12, that's satisfied, that's a check. Also, does looking up aggravate symptoms? If looking up does not aggravate symptoms, well then that's a check. If looking up does aggravate symptoms, well then that's actually going to disfavor the thoracic manipulation for neck pain. And so obviously you would just have the patient look up at the ceiling, active cervical extension, to determine whether or not it aggravates it. Okay. Also, we're gonna look at cervical extension range of motion, which you can obviously do with a goniometer, or in this case, you can also use an inclinometer. That would probably be easier. And we're looking for cervical extension range of motion that's less than 30 degrees. Okay, so if they come in and have 20 degrees of cervical extension, well, then that one's satisfied. Okay? If they already have, let's say, 40 degrees of extension, well, then they don't get a check there. The last one here is diminished upper thoracic spine kyphosis. So remember that the thoracic spine has a normal amount of kyphosis. It's not completely straight, right? There's a little bit of kyphosis in it, uh, but you can have too much kyphosis. You can also have too little kyphosis. So in the study where they looked at this, they would do a postural assessment, obviously in the sagittal plane, because that would allow you to see the spine from the side. And excessive kyphosis was defined as an increase in the convexity. So basically, hyperkyphosis, too much forward curvature. But then there's diminished kyphosis. This is more of a flattening of the convexity of the thoracic spine. So instead of being hyperkyphotic, this is more of a hypokyphosis, where it's actually closer to being straight rather than the normal amount of kyphosis. That's the, the diminished upper thoracic spine kyphosis. Okay. Now, with this clinical prediction rule, we really only need three out of six of these to be positive. 
Okay, so it could be any of these three. So if three out of six of these are positive, that's associated with a positive likelihood ratio of 5.5. That's not perfect, but it's still pretty good. Okay? And if any three of these are positive, it changes the pretest probability of this working from 54% all the way up to 86%. In other words, if three out of six of these are positive, any three, uh, there's an 86% chance that thoracic manipulation will actually help the person's neck pain. Okay. And so then we can proceed to any of these three thoracic manipulations. The first here is a supine mid-thoracic flexion-based thrust. The second one is a prone thoracic thrust. And the third here is the seated thoracic distraction manipulation. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of these three clinical prediction rules and how they're applied in practice. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.